Today, I'm with a hustler, a rap hustler. He's an artist, he's a CEO, but more importantly, he's a navigator. I'm with a man who went from flipping production to one of the greatest record labels to producing albums with living legends. He was all over the screens with Crispy and wasn't afraid to step out of the spotlight to create something bigger. And we're yeah. going to talk about all of that today. Kia Shine, welcome to the show. I appreciate you taking the time to join me. No, nah, thank you so much, bro. I appreciate you having me, man. I, lo I love. I was doing my research on you, bro, and I see you've really been well versed in the interviewing thing. I love media, you know what I mean, and those that participate in great media and really doing the thing. So, uh, salute to you, bro, and thanks for your time for having me, bro. I definitely appreciate that. You know, first, what I like to do is take it back and get an idea of what it was like for you growing up, you know, and actually where you're from. Let everybody know. I am from a city called Memphis, Tennessee. You know what I mean? Memphis being the Bible buckle. You know what I mean? I feel like, uh, but it's also the birthplace of rock and roll, uh, hip hop. To me, as far as Southern hip hop is the backbone of it. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a very special place. Very, very special place, man. Uh, barbecue and music. That's what we do. You know what I mean? Music. <laughs> When do you feel like Memphis really got their first chance in the game? Uh, it started with, uh, well, if we talk in hip hop music, then we got to take, then we got to start it with like, you know, Gangsta Pat, uh, Al Capone, um, A Ball, MJG, Skinny Pimp, you know what I mean? Those guys, Three Six Mafia, you know, those are the guys that really are the forefathers of the, of the, uh, of the hip hop scene in in uh, in Memphis, you know what I mean. These were the guys that really kicked it, that kicked the doors down, and really uh really really formulated a sound that is Memphis. DJ Squeaky, uh, some of the producers, uh, Slice T, uh, T Mix. These are the guys that really made Memphis um, what it is. You know what I mean, as far as on the sound, the synonymous with the sound of Memphis. Um, and um, if you go before that, then you got to go to Stax Records, David Porter, Isaac Hayes. You know, you got to go back to the 70s and what was going on with that, um, and what their movement was. M music has always been the the heritage of Memphis, Tennessee. M Memphis is what we got. Like, if you go to California, those guys got the tree, you know what I mean? That's what they got out there. You go to Idaho, they got potatoes. Well, in Memphis, we got music, you know what I mean? And we've always had music. And when did you first take an interest and get involved in the music industry? Um, started from a very young age, man, just being able to be um, able to freestyle and, you know, hip hop. I always feel like hip hop was born the same. It's funny because we're sitting right here behind me. This is the key to Memphis right here. You know what I mean? The key to the city right there. But um, um, you got the key to the city. Yeah, this is the key. This is this is the actual key to Memphis right here. You know what I mean? That's the key to the city right there. You same. I mean? Yeah. Um, but uh, the um, it started me just freestyling in high school, you know, what I mean, just being able to, you know, freestyle and wanting to be with music because hip hop was my generation's music as opposed to blues and, and, and rhythm and blues and the stuff that was going on prior to us. That was more of my parents music, which I still loved it. You know, what I mean, it was very, definitely very inspiring. But it, hip hop was my music. It was what made me want to get into it on the business, though was a young man named uh, Ernest Draper, who was a brother of Tony Draper. Tony Draper started Suave House Records. Suave House signed A-Ball and MJG to their first record contract and, and put them, putting them on the road and got them. That was a coming out hard record that really, you know, really pushed A-Ball and MJG into the game. So I knew those guys and I learned from those guys and watching those guys do their thing made me want to get involved with it you know what i mean god always put me around certain people that were in the game and really making a mark so when you got these people around you you know you know you walk with wise men you become wise you know what i mean um as my mom said in her words hang around nine broke people you'd be the 10 person broke hang around nine people doing it you'll be the 10 person doing it rest of so so to me i was blessed in the position to be able to have people that inspired me around me you know to be something you got to see something and i was able to see something you know so that really made me want to be able to get into the music game and um it's how though the how and how i was going to do my thing 
that really was kind of shaped by what I was seeing and just being able to take a leap of faith to be able to start a record label and, and, and do that. And then just to see how that just one door opens up four or five different doors. When you're starting to walk towards your path, you take a couple of steps towards your purpose. Got to take a couple of pur the purpose in, in, in the universe, take a couple of steps towards you. And then you kind of start to kind of shape your way as you go. You kind of you're learning as you go. And that's what I was doing. Just kind of buying my own lessons and learning as I as I went, you know. So what was the first opportunity that you had when you started making music? First opportunity was to invest in my brother's group. Um, I was doing pretty good for myself in the corporate world. I took my, my income and put it into a record label, partnered up with a few of my friends. We called it Diamond Cut Entertainment. And we started, we had a distributor that was in our backyard, Selecto Hits. And we started distributing music immediately through Selecto Hits. And that was allowed me to be able to learn the game. And we're trying to break a new artist and trying to break my brother's group, which was called L.I. And um, we put out a few albums on L.I. and another group called Black Kennedys. And we're just doing that. And that was just kind of teaching me the lessons and how the music thing from the from a, from a boss perspective of distributing music through a distributor and having your own artist signed to you. I learned an independent game that way. And like I said, by watching Tony Draper and Ernest Draper and doing those things. All right. So I had my own. They were distributing through Selecto Hits, too. And so it was three, six mile for you. And so it was a lot of the guys that were in Memphis. We had our own distributor in the backyard. So we was able to uh, put out our own music, um, like much like a lot of the markets in New Orleans or or a lot of the West Coast hip hop uh, that was coming out. They had distribution. We had distribution in Memphis through Selecto Hits was distributing a lot of the blues records. So I was able to use those relationships and be able to put out music. So I bought a lot of lessons that way. Didn't make a lot of money, but I bought a lot of lessons. Those lessons will come in handy, though, because by doing that, I had a chance meeting with Dino Del Valle in uh, who came to Memphis to sign his other act, Play a Fly, who was also a very underground legend in Memphis uh, with the music. He was coming to sign Play a Fly and a friend of mine, Rico, brought him by my house and he checked out my label. He didn't really dig with the music, but. He definitely liked my energy. He said, if I ever came to New York, look him up. And that was the light bulb right then. That was like, yo, go to New York. Went to New York, met with him. And when I met with him, I played new music from my label uh, that we had been putting together since we just made this New York A&R in contact. At the time, we're talking about this is 1999 going into 2000. So he had just signed cash money to that ultra $30 million deal that was like the biggest deal at the time. And I just met the person that gave him that check. So to me, that was a that was my first introduction into the real game, making a real contact. Him and Tina Davis were two people that I met back in 99 going into 2000. And meeting those, those individuals led to me having meetings with them in New York. When I met with Dino, he didn't like any of the music that I brought him, but he I knew he liked me, so I was going to just spit a freestyle for him, just let him know that I'm a CEO that could rap. But I put a beat in. When I put the beat in, he loved the beat so much I didn't get a chance to even rap. He was like, bro, this is dope. Let me buy this beat from you. And he said he'd give me $5,000 for the beat. I'm like, $5,000 for the beat? Oh, the beat is yours, because I was getting free beats from this particular producer at the time. I never paid for beats. So when he just said, you know, 5000 for a beat, it was like, okay, wow. So I had a whole new business model i could come to new york and sell beats because i wasn't really necessarily making money with the group that i was investing money in with my brother's group dirty fresh who is now a great producer but i wasn't making a lot of money in his investing in his group but i bought a lot of lessons but when i started to sell beats i started to make money so i'm like well, you know what this is i'm rap hustling this is this is the way i can go to new york and just play beats and get five thousand dollars a beat you know, me coming from Memphis, I didn't know anything about that. So that was a huge, like, that was an eye opener for me. And it was also a way to be able to get relationships with A&Rs that wasn't about my own music or what I was pushing, but it was able to be, to be able to engage with whatever they were already working with. So that was the way for me to be able to do so. I was able to engage with those A&Rs. Dino hooked me up with another couple of A&Rs, and I ended up doing a production deal with Rough Riders and selling beats to, uh, to D&Y over there. So that just propelled me to be able to get a production situation and a publishing situation off selling beats. The producer's beats that I was selling ended up being Drummer Boy. We all know Drummer Boy is a classic producer from Memphis uh, who did records like Put On For My City and stuff like that for Jeezy. And, you know, he's a classic producer. 
but um but he was that was who i had you know what i mean i was god like i said before in a conversation the people around me god had these great people that were around me and i was just open enough to be able to okay use these pieces that were around me to be able to to do what i needed to do to propel you know what i mean to excel so um that's how it kind of really kicked off the door and started for me is with selling beats so how did you connect with the producer drummer boy in the first place just a dope producer that i met you know what i mean just in memphis and like you know networking or whatever like end up getting some of his i knew his brother insane wayne and in some breast in peace insane wayne he was also a really was a good, really good producer as well but he passed away a few years ago but um he i knew his brother and his brother told me about him and i ended up going over to his house and heard some of his beats he was still in high school he was just graduating from high school that year uh when i sold those beats for him so it was just like met his brother heard the beast believed in it enough to be able to play him and to be able to go and push him and you know you know we all need each other man in this thing man you know what i mean like you know if you could be able to help somebody else you know to me that's that's how you get blessing if you be a blessing you end up you know catching a blessing so that's how i got started with that you know what i mean i met him and his beast i just heard it i was like bro these beasts are it i was like whoa this is incredible like and um and and just wasn't afraid to press play you know what i mean and be able to uh see what i could be able to get going and but uh, that situation with me meeting dino and him buying that beat wouldn't have happened if i wouldn't have invested in my brother's group to be able to just try to try to try to get him going so my my blessings always have come from me trying to help somebody else you know what i'm saying you know you give enough people what they want somebody gonna give you what you want you know what i mean Man, Rough Riders had Swiss beats at that time. How did you end up getting their ear? Bundo Calamundo. His name was Bundo Calamundo, bro. He was a really cool cat, man, that was close to DNY. And um, and he was like, man, he loved my beats and he loved my hustle. And he was like, I'm going to put you with DNY. I'm going to see what you can do. Played the beats, and they had an artist named Jersey Monet, an R&B artist that they were putting out at the time. And, um, and I ended up getting a beat on her album. And DMX was on that song. So that's how I ended up getting a 10 song deal with them and then end up getting a publishing deal with Universal Music Publishing based on me having the records with Universal with Dino and that system and also having the records with Rough Riders and their system. So I was able to get a publishing deal, took the publishing money and then I've invested that to my label that I call Rap Hustlers. And I came back to Memphis and I um, just re reinvented my label thing. And I um, signed uh, Skinny Pimp, uh, Yo Gotti, um, Gangsta Black, uh, Lit Chat, Criminal Main, all these artists that uh, Mr. Ian, a lot of artists that are popping, that were popping in Memphis. And I just put my sound uh, on them and uh, put the producers that I um, that I had under me that I was selling beats for with all these artists. And we all worked together and created a cool vibe for Rap Hustlers and, and made some good records. That allowed me to get a distribution deal with TVT Records, um, and then distributing um, Yo Gotti's Life album, which is a, which is a, his first national album that was classic, still streaming to this day. You should check it out; it's really a dope project. Um, and um, Skinny Pimp's album too, and I was able to put those through TVT and be able to break through. The same year, Little John was breaking through, and Ying Yang Twins when they were on TVT, I was on TVT too, but I was having my own distribution deal. I, I didn't i wasn't signed per se to them i just had i was distributing through them so um i had a boss deal at a very young age and i was and also out. some dope collaborations with yo Gotti and little john that yeah. I will only find on the life album exactly yeah, exactly and that's when when john was just popping off so it was just it was just dope man to be able to be at that time you know where southern music really wasn't accepted like that in new york only a few labels really got it you know what i mean and tvt was one universal was one um that got it so you know it was just dope to be able to be doing business with those labels at the time when they were like some of the only people that really good they got so the music you know what i mean and i was around there pushing yo Gotti and, and pushing you know for little john and pushing for these guys a long, long time ago you know what i mean you know had a little flip on that album too as a matter of fact so yeah, man. And then um had records with Mike Jones and Lil Chat. It was always about collaborating, man, and just putting artists with each other, man. And back, this was before Instagram, so the world was a little bit um, bigger. So you had to have your market on lock 
to be able to get a deal. You had to have your situation on, on lock. So, you know, and word of mouth was key. So when people came through Memphis, you know, they knew we had that. We, we were the guys in the town, you know, just like so we would go connect with artists in Houston, artists in Atlanta, and to really be able to just keep that word of mouth going and be able to really making those fans and really, uh, you know, just taking the page out of No Limit and Cash Money's book, you know what I mean, and, 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 and Suave House book, you know, to be able to, to uh, push my brand. That's all I did. I just learned from those who came before me. And just I didn't reinvent the wheel. I just made a better, my own version of a tire. You know what I mean? That I put out there. That they, they got on the street and got rolling. You know? Yeah, I've got to give you props for what you did after securing that deal with Rough Riders, taking it and getting a publishing deal through Universal. A lot of yeah. people wouldn't have done that. They would have been like, "Oh, we got a big check through Rough Riders." But you did the smart thing by doing that because yeah. at the time, Rough Riders was a major label. So any of those ten records that you produced could have been major hits. Exactly. And it just, it gave me leverage. You know, you got to have, you got to move with leverage. And I was able to move with some leverage early to be able to uh, get the funds to be able to really push my label and push my, push my brand out there, bro. That's, that's what I did. And um, it was good. It was a lot of good times, man. Just, just, it's just dope to be able to see where, you know, where these artists are now, like see where Yo Gotti is doing now um with glorilla to see you know and, and with cmg to see even criminal man who's like a really big uh tubi guy he's putting out tubi movies every week um to to see what john is at to see you know a lot of these artists that i was able to work with back then just to see how it looks skinny pimp is one of the most sampled um artists to this day like you know what i mean he sampled it's from asap rocky just signed, sampled him uh ty dollar he's all uh, drake He's always being sampled, you know what I mean? So it's just dope to be able to see these artists and these people that I was working with then and just be able to still get their flowers today. You know what I mean? It's really dope, man. Did you carry on a relationship with Drummer Boy like after he had really hit his stride when he was working yeah. with CI and Young Jeezy? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, me and me and Drum, uh, we Drummer is a definitely a, a Memphis advocate and he lives out here in Atlanta like I do. But we always home together. We were together when when Glorilla got her uh, key to the city um, uh, in September on 901 Day. Um, September 1st is 901 Day. We just did a big thing for Memphis for 901 Day. So we we are definitely uh, still connected and um, still very much uh, cool and got good vibes with each other, bro, and always uh, are looking out, man. So uh, shout out to Drummer Boy, man. Definitely got a good relationship with him still to this day. What's your thoughts on Drummer Boy's title as the Trap Founder? Do you believe that uh, Drummer Boy is, in fact, the Trap Founder? He is definitely one of the ones. Like, I mean, between him, Zaytoven, it's between him and Zaytoven. Like, you know what I mean? Like, because they both, they both, like, that Trap thing was, was really their thing. Between Zaytoven with Gucci Man, Drummer did a lot more work with Yo Gotti, even after me and Gotti stopped working with each other for a minute. Um, you know, he definitely helped personify that sound from Yo Gotti, uh, even more so. Like, you know, but I think he's definitely, if he's not the one, he's one of the ones, you know what I mean? That personifies that trap sound for certain, for certain. Did you know that you were pushing a trap sound back then? Uh, like, or did you know that <laughs> trap was going to become so popular? We, we just thought we were pushing the Memphis sound, actually. Like, we just was pushing the Memphis sound with a little, you know, just with a little bit. Three Six Mafia sound was a little darker, you know what I mean? But uh, but it still was kind of trap, you know what I mean? Um, and crunk, you know what I mean? And we were just pushing the rap hustles, we were just pushing a little bit more of a party vibe wave, but still very much Memphis. Um, uh, Gotti was making a lot of dope music, trap music, you know what I mean? With the with the Life album, it just wasn't named trap music, you know what I mean? I think Ti name trap music he trade ti gave the name of trap music you know what i'm saying he he coined the name you know what i mean but we were definitely doing the thing you know what i mean you know we were doing we were doing it we were actually were making trap music though um with a little spin on it though with a memphis with a memphis you know you know we memphis we didn't call it a trap we just call it a track like you see, if you sell dope it was on the track you know what i'm saying but um but it was like but you know you know they the atl coins the trap and that's what works so you know it is what it is but i think memphis has always had his own sound anyway like you know so whether you want to call it it's kind of trap-ish but uh but it's memphis you know what i mean
Can you tell me how you got distribution through TVT? I took a tour bus, wrapped it, put all my artists on it, got my songs going in about 15 to 20 markets at radio, got my media base up and got my and just had my word of mouth going. And I drove the tour bus up to TVT and I got a record with A Ball, MJG, myself, and Yo Gotti. And I had it on BET. And I had all that going for me when I drove the tour bus up to BET, uh, up to TVT, and I got the deal. Just like that, you know what I mean? Marketing, marketing, and being able to show numbers, being able to show, you know, that something was already tangible and working. I think it's very important as an artist that, especially to this day and age, even back then, the same rules apply. You got to be able to show people that what you got is just dope, and not just by listening to it. It needs to be able to pass whatever of the. Um, of the the i guess the word would be um any of the indicators that is needed to be able to get that check cut you know what i mean so the indicators now is streaming or the indicators or whatever it is that's going to be able to show that there's an audience already tapped into what you're doing it's not just about having a hit song it's about what the hit song is doing and with today's technology is going to be able to show you if a song is on the radio or what uh what are the uh shazam's numbers like on it what are the numbers you know what i mean what are people actually when the song plays do they listen to it do they shazam it or, do, or does it or do they switch the record all these things can be your song is streaming what is the skip trace of people skipping what is the skip rate you know what i mean data right now can tell you everything about a record and what's going on with it so back in my day the uh those nuances were bds's you know, and, and sales at the store and stuff like that. But as we continue to go with data and technology, the technology can let a person know whether this record, what it is and what it ain't. You know what I mean? People are going by data. That's why the record industry is so shook up the way it is now, because the eye and the ear test is out. It's really about the data. They just want to know what the data is. And if the data is saying that it is a record and people are into this record and whether that's from uh, social media at standpoint where people are starting to put it on all the audios or on the reels and stuff like that or it's breaking on tiktok you know what i mean these are the these are the new nuances that have to be happening for you to be able to say you have a hit record in today's marketplace so it's like i hit the nuances for my day you know what i mean for when i but you know so it's like you have to hit those nuances today to be able to say this is a record or not now there i could hear a record and see an artist and be like this is a this is artist is incredible this is a star this is that but they go about data right now you know what i mean and none of that really matters right now if the data says it then you're all right if the data don't say it then they're not gonna give you that check can you tell me about how you linked up with yo Gotti to produce the life album that was a uh, link with Gotti because of the momentum that i had going with rap hustlers in the city with my label and what i had going with skinny pimp um because of that because of that momentum that i had going on in the streets and and just really all the producers that i was working with selling beach for them getting money for them i was really the guy in memphis that was really a key to the industry and because of that momentum god he called me one day and was like bro what's up you know he wanted to link we linked we put him on a record with skinny pimp that featured a ball called tvs uh you should check that video out skinny pimp kingpin skinny pimp tvs first video i ever shot it's on youtube now um and uh, we got that that we put them on that song and that song broke you know what i mean and and because people love that record and it got us shows it got us booking it got us touring it got us moving around then we uh we were able to uh we were able to you know it made sense for guy to want to do more business with us because we had the city on lock you know what i mean so we uh we linked from right there. That's how I was able to do it, and 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 I was able to get in the studio and just cook, man. And we cooked up some classic records, man, that people still play to this day. You know what I mean? Really was a really was a great time, a nostalgic period of time in Memphis, Tennessee. Really was, man. And what was Yo Gotti like back then? You know, looking at this first album cover, Life, it was like a Cash Money vibe, like a master, yeah. no limit yeah. type of vibe. It made Yo Gotti, I even remember it from back then, seeing it. Like, it made Yo Gotti look like a big deal with that album. Yeah, yeah. Um, as you know, the covers were very important back then. As you know, Pen and Pixel was the, was the thing back in the day, that style of artwork. 
Um, so like I said, we just took a page out of Cash Money's book and was able to deliver that. Gotti was spitting the trap rap even before it was trap rap. And he was doing that thing. And he really had the streets of North Memphis where I'm from and where he's from on lock. So it was like being able to just to grow him and get him outside the marketplace. Um, Gotti always was a good businessman. He always was a he had a business mind, you know what I mean? And he always uh was uh able to have he had his team with him then. And you know, I remember Jook, rest in peace, all those guys back then, you know, around and you know, he definitely had a support system already in place and um he always had a vision of what he wanted to do um he was smart you know i mean he wasn't just a regular artist he was smart he still had one foot in the streets and one foot out you know which was a lot of the stuff that i you know me and him we just you know that part of it some of the things in the streets you know what i mean just you know it wasn't it wasn't really like some of the things that were going on like you know for me i was all the way in music you know what i mean so it's like I just couldn't have myself around certain things, you know what I'm saying? Like certain energies or whatever. I'm like it to this day, but, um, but we was able to connect on making great music, classic records. And he was definitely, a uh, he knew where he wanted to go. He said a vision back then for what he wanted to do. So it's why it doesn't surprise me right now to see what he's doing. Like I said, little John had, uh, I seen he had a few features on this album with the East side boys. Were you guys in the studio collaborating with yeah. little John? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we, we did that uh dirty south soldier record we did that in the studio little john made the beat in the studio we did it all in that wasn't like send the beat and we wrapped on and on we did all that in the studio together in memphis tennessee all of that was done together yes indeed so we worked in the studio with little john on that particular record man you know it's just dope to be able it just like i said i was talking to little john's son just yesterday um just it just dope to be able to just to look back on it and be like damn like you know this man i seen him in, in, in there on the drum machine making the jump like really doing it doing the chance doing the, it all of it in the studio all of it right there all of it right in the studio was pitbull around back then i know he was tvt I, I met pitbull i knew pitbull i still you know uh, him and big teach um, I knew I knew those guys very well. Like they were around, you know what I mean? They were definitely around. Um, he had made that switch to, to Pitbull wearing suits. He was still wearing the t-shirts, you know what I mean? And and doing that thing. But yeah, he was around. It, it was around for sure. So after TVT went bankrupt, how were you able to get the ownership for the Life album? How'd that all work out? Um, it worked out because TVT did very bad business gotta be honest they did a lot of bad business and a lot of times when you get when you do bad business bad you know that's what comes from that you know what i mean so um i think um yeah when he when he when he went shut down all the, the masters reverted back to me um and um yeah and i got them you know what i mean i'm gonna be releasing some more of the classic records that i put out through them um a little bit later on top of the year of next year as well like the skinny pimp record that i put out the tvt it's not even on um, platforms right now so i'm gonna re-release that i'm re-releasing the lachat album on the platforms and re-releasing this the uh we put out two albums on skinny so both of those are coming out so yeah you know what i mean and it's just dope because if you look at skinny pimps monthly listeners they're crazy and it's just like um yeah we're getting ready to drop those and you know and can cash out on those too so just a blessing to be able to have those masters and be able to uh because during the time he was it was really bad i mean like him didn't he didn't pay me for that guy record during that time you know Steve golly didn't and, and it really caused a lot of friction between myself and yo because of what took place and then guy signed directly to him and he, he he had a bad deal so it was really a bad it was a that was a horrible deal but in the end to this day i still may am able to win because i able to eat off of those off of those albums now myself so it's it's a beautiful thing man so that's what happened they actually tvt actually re-signed yo Gotti without your involvement yeah and right and and why when this album had did like a hundred thousand records you know what i'm saying and he didn't pay me for him or anything like that or whatever i had to sue this dude and um and then he signed guy directly so that that that's what caused all the friction between myself and yo at the time but at the time i'd say you know i decided i'm gonna do my own thing and I'm gonna become an artist, you know what I mean? Because I was already featured on these on these albums. So I said, you know, I just gotta do it to get what I never had, I gotta do what I've never done. And what I've never done is put out my own solo records. So I focus on myself.
and um i had to focus on other people for so long and so lo and behold so crispy and my vibe came and i was able to you know get my own deal and be able to uh and and to really shoot off myself so that was a a, a huge blessing for me you know what i mean to be able to do it after putting out so much time and energy into other artists and other people i was finally able to do my own thing and that was just a beautiful thing to see it pop off and see it work you know what i mean and get signed into a major label and be able to do all those things that came along with that so that was just a, bl a blessing a true blessing bro what do you remember about la chat getting recognition after the song chicken head with project pat i remember like just she's she la chat is a great person she's always been the same since i since i met her and um a beautiful soul good energy and um i just remember her popping off but she had some problems with the label after that and um she came to me and was like sean can you help me and i ended up she left the six mafia and i was able to put out an album on her and helped her out you know what i mean and get her back on her feet and she helped me get back on my feet too because i wasn't in the best position after going through that situation with the life album with steve Gottlieb and all that so she still believed in what i was able to do and was able to put that life out I mean, that uh that dramatized album out which we're going to be re-releasing again in uh, in um in january of next year of all platforms so what made you say let me give la chat a chance after her split with three six she had a big following she had a huge following you know that chicken head record was classic she had a huge following then she had a lot of sales behind her too uh with her project so to me was being able to pick artists that already had some sort of fan base and sales history so if i put some money into them i knew i had some people that'd be able to go to the store and buy it you know what i mean so that's why it made sense to be able to do business with her so didn't you think you might rub the three six mafia members the wrong way by picking up her artist i didn't give a fuck you know what i mean like at the end of the day three six mafia we're cool now but back in the day they they wasn't they wasn't very happy about uh what rap hustles was doing in the marketplace and how we were um kind of taking our own putting our own flag down in memphis it wasn't like a warm reception for us um so you know it was like i i really didn't care about that plus i was in such in a bad financial situation after the situation happened with yo Gotti and tbt but it was like man shit, i gotta get some money and, and that was and that was just that you know she chose me you know what i mean so at the end of the day man i ain't got nothing to do with none of that you know what i mean what, what anything that took place prior to me with the, with her i just saw the artist i saw the opportunity and i knew i could be able to put some work in and i did that so what do you remember most about working with the chat her great energy um a great vibe and just she she the same way people love sexy red and glow Rilla for they hood you know like just the hood queen but like just likable hood princess the chat was already there you know what i mean she was there and that's what that's what she personified with the project and just a real good person man so did she already have those records ready to go or did you actually, actually no no we no we no we, we we worked on those records no no we no we we, we everything was from scratch we we you know we didn't do nothing there from 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 what three six mafia did we did our own thing so now you've positioned artists and producers what made you say it's my turn and start to focus on your own solo career just really man like seeing that i built a base of people when i would go out people would rap my verses that i featured on my artist person my i would feature on my artist music that I, the albums that i put out i featured on them right so people would rap my verses to me when i was in public they would request me to come perform songs i would get features you know what i mean from people want me to book me so i was like you know what apparently they like what i'm doing so let, let me just put out a whole project a whole body of work let me put out a single at least so um that's what it makes sense this is, this is a, a being a businessman like okay if people like something and you see the audience actually likes it then you need to go ahead and serve as the audience you know what i mean supply and demand i'm the, i was building a demand so it's time for me to put a supply out there and i put up and, and the supply was me putting out my first single respect my fresh and um and that first single along with this record called stunner frames got me uh, i had a bidding war with every record label at the time you know what i mean so you know I, I just knew it was my turn to do something different you know what i mean instead of always people won't want you can't make people do what you want them to do you know what i mean you could produce you could you could you could help but people have control of themselves you can't control people you only control your actions so for me it's like you know i gotta just do had to do what i had to do for me at the time you know what i mean sometimes you got to focus on you you can't sleep on yourself so after you started releasing your music, 
and the bidding war started, who was throwing deals at you? And how did you end up signing with Sylvia Roan? She gave me a promise that she really didn't keep. But at the same time, like she had the most money. And at the time, and I don't recommend anybody listening to this to do this. Don't always go with the most money. Go with the best system. Um, but at the time, I was coming about of a financial situation that I needed more money. So, you know, Jay Records, when they were around, Clive Davis, I met with him. Uh, Larry Jackson was over there. Now he's over at Apple now, but he offered a deal. Um, Todd Moskowitz, who's now at Interscope, but uh, him and Joe, him and Joey IE, they all, Joe, Todd's with Alamo now, and, and Joey IE's with, with Interscope. But both of those guys uh, offered me deals. Um, let's see here. Um, there was a, there was Jive Records. They offered two. Um, it was like Job, Interscope, uh, Asylum, um, um, J, um, Universal, um, and a few and a, and a couple of others during that time. I, um, like I said, we're talking about 06. But like, yeah, all of them, like they all they all flew me out and they all, you know, put, presented, you know what I mean, some, you know, some cool offers. But it just wasn't, like I said, if I would have came out in this time, in this season of, of Instagram and all that or whatever, right? Like, man, I would have been able to get a huge, huge deal. But in in my time, it still was a situation where like Southern music still was just being accepted. You know what I'm saying? So it wasn't like only they didn't really believe in it all the way, all the way, the way they do now. You know what I mean? And they see how viable it is now. So you know, a good deal back in the day was like maybe walking away with four, five hundred thousand dollars was that was a, a good deal, you know what I mean, for for a person from Memphis. Now, man, look, it's million dollar deals coming out of Memphis, you know what I'm saying? And, and everyone got deals and everybody is signed and, and all that or whatever. Like, so it just wasn't like that back before, you know what I mean? But it was definitely was uh was a cool process though. It made me feel good to like after working with so many other artists to finally like have all these labels calling me per se was was that was a blessing it really was so what made you choose universal was it a life to, uh, she gave me the money to the advance money and she gave me the money to do my album most of these companies were trying to just give me like we'll give you half a million dollars but you gotta do the album with that too you know what i mean so my thing was like i really want to get the advance and then be able to also have the budget to do the album and that's and that's what Sylvia Ron was uh, was offering. So what did you do with the money when you signed? Uh, what did you buy with it? I really didn't buy very much at all. Um, what I did was in, invest the money back into like my project. Like I, I I spent a lot of money on marketing to be able to push my songs out further at radio to be able to get the label to push the button on dropping my actual album. You know what I mean? So that's what, what was that's what I did. I put the money into doing that. You know, I put like I put like a hundred thousand or hundred and twenty thousand on just pushing my records at radio to get crispy going, to get my stuff going. Cause Universal had a lot of artists signed to them. So I like I was moving like I had my budget open already to make them open my budget. You know what I'm saying? You know, so that's that's what I did. But I put I reinvested a lot of money back on my on me and being able to uh to get my album out. And then um and in real estate, you know what I mean? That's it. Tell me about creating crispy with playing skills after they made riding dirty. Um, we were in the studio, Sylvia sent me down there to work with them. And I mean, they had just like it was like they had cool beats, but as a producer myself and one who knows music, what I wanted to come with, and I had my own in-house producers, my brother Dirty Fresh, who was part of the group that I first signed when I got into music, he became a producer. So you gotta understand I had two songs that got me my deal and we produced these things in house. My brother Dirty Fresh, myself and Tommy Rich, this is my in-house producer. So it was like, you all were sending me to work with these guys. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. But really the way my deal was structured, I had to do 14 of them. I was gonna do pretty much 80% of the album is gonna be done by me. So when I went to another producer, I'm really like, you know, look, we got this, this got to be it. I'm not spending money out of my budget for nothing. You know what I mean? So it's like when I'm listening to the beats, I'm like, nah, this ain't it. This ain't it. This ain't it. Nah, this ain't it. This ain't. I'm just like all day. This ain't it. This is not. This is not. 
I'm not moved by this shit. You know what I'm saying? So it's like until they started to just create on the spot and we created a crispy as like this is an idea for the hook. They built the beat around the hook and we made that. That's when we made a hit record because we were then producing together. You know what I mean? And that's how that came about. And I went and got in there and I freestyled the whole jump and got it done. Do you yeah. remember bringing Crispy to BET? Remember bringing it to BET? I'd already hosted Rap City, so I already had a great relationship with BET. I could have been the host of Rap City. I, when I signed with Sylvia, I'd already had an offer, job offer for Rap City to host Rap City. I'd already host the interim host. My first guest Classic was Ricky show. Uh, Yeah, say it again. Classic show. Yes, I, I could have been that host. Uh, they just let me do interim shows hosting with Rick Ross, but I was. they offered me the job. Stephen Hill offered me the job, but at the end of the day, Sylvia Rome didn't want me to be known as an actual, uh, like BJ or whatever. She wanted me to be known as a as an artist, so she was like, "You can't take that job." I wanted the job, you know what I mean? That was a classic show. I love hip hop. I could have been able to do that, but I said I'll get back to film and television after that. That I had to do this this deal thing or whatever. So yeah, but they loved it though. What I did, I brought Krispy Kreme donuts to every. Body on the, on the staff when I came through with my single. He did the same thing for Universal too. When I like I was doing that with my own money. I was doing stuff like that, taking the TV out to dinner, with my own money, taking BET out to dinner with my own money. I spent a lot of my deal money making relationships that I would have that I still got long after my deal was over with. You know what I'm saying? I came into this thing with eyes wide open. Like I knew Universal didn't know how to really make hit records. They just chased hit records. So it's like, you know, I just got the money. And got the relationships and then parted ways really no sooner than after the album dropped. You know what I mean? I was like, because they just really wasn't on the business on promotions. And I was doing so much of it myself anyway. I'm like, well, I don't really need y'all because I'm doing this myself anyway. You know what I mean? So, um, but they gave me some good relationships or whatever that I got to this day. So I still kept on kept those. But uh, yeah, that was just a brief synopsis, a free, a brief, very brief relationship. And then I went right to Empire with Ghazi. Right after that, I was one of the first people that signed with Gazi back in 08, 09, you know what I'm saying, with Empire. So, uh, you know, and I've been rocking with Empire ever since. Yep, and now look where Empire is, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, they, now they like the shit, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, so, like, yeah, it's just, I'm, you know, that's just, once again, good people are always being around me and being able to just, you know, be be open to what God is saying, do, do next, not ever being caught up in the situation so much and not being humble. I believe if you be humble, you won't crumble and your blessings won't fumble. You know what I mean? If you be humble enough to be able to receive and see what's going on around you, you'll be able to stay winning. But it's when you start thinking you up and you and you are above everybody else, you got to stay eye level. You know what I mean? That way you can be able to receive and see what's going on around you so you can know when to pivot and how to be able to keep getting it. You know what I'm saying? Young Dro and Mano feature on your song, Checking My Fresh. Fabulous. Yes. Video. Tell me how that whole thing came together. All right, so that Dro is all me and Dro used to live in the same uh building, uh the 12 in Atlantic Station. So we lived there, and that's my guy. Like, you know what I mean? Me, I've always just dug him musically. He's been he's been my partner in fresh for a long time. You know, we both always been stylish and all that vibe. So it was just dope to be able to link with him. Uh C Rod, his uh, C, uh his producer, whatever, like was my guy. I like at the time. Dro was resurfacing again with the uh with the ain't I record and um he had just featured on that joint and it was crazy and I was like yeah let me go ahead and just go and get Dro because we hadn't put a record together yet so let's put me with Dro his producer uh C over at Grand Hustle I already had a great relationship with T.I. and Jason Jeter and all those guys so I put that record together we recorded it at Grand Hustle and then um and then I did an interview with Satellite Radio and Mano heard my interview and dug my interview or whatever. And when I saw having to see him out one day or whatever, bro, and I said, bro, let me play you this record. And I played him the record. He was like, bro, this shit crazy. Let me hop on it too. So then he hopped on it. And then we shot the video at this spot called 10 Pin at Atlantic Station, where me and Gro Dro both lived at. And um, it was a bowling alley and uh, just, just a great time, bro. You know what I mean? All came together. One of those things were like, you know, you know when it's supposed to be or meant to be when you don't got to force it. When it just flows like water from a faucet, you know what I'm saying? It just flows, like you know what I mean. And that was one of my ideas that, like, I heard. And then Jay Z, Jay Z sampled me when he said, "I heard how to dress it by checking my fresh." You gotta understand, the song that got me my deal in 06 was a song called "Respect My Fresh." 
You know what I'm saying? I was the first person to come out and be like, like my to to come on there like my fresh being that thing being that like my fresh. There's a as a as a thing as an entity or my fresh being that like and just saying in that manner and with with in that uh in that vernacular. You know what I mean? Um, so Jay Z cool back then. Yeah, that was like my like my fresh like nobody was saying it. I it said that. It became, yeah. it became one of the things back then. Yeah. A lot of people from twenty twenty four might not understand that though. Exactly, but that was like a thing. You know what I'm saying? That was like a thing. Like you know what I mean? Like um, like saying the word gang today. You know what I'm saying? What up, gang? You know what I mean? Like that there slang. It was like one of the things I started. So when Jay sampled it, I sampled it. I was like, that's me anyway. I sampled it. Quick story. So fast, so this comes out. I didn't even clear the sample. I did not clear the sample with Jay-Z. The song is a is the MTV jam of the week. So I know he's here seeing it. I never cleared it at all because he got it from me. Okay. So if it wasn't true, then he would have tried to sue me or something for sampling his voice, right? He never More did. Likely. Yeah. He never did. Never did. When I'm talking to Big John and G. Robeson, when I'm negotiating my money from Drake Best I Ever Had stuff, because G. Robeson was managing Drake at the time, Big John comes on the phone and says, you know, you at the time, this is 09, when the Best I Ever Had just comes out and Checking My Fresh is out. And they're like, yo, Jay, talk to me about this Checking My Fresh song, but you know what I mean? Like, they're trying to act like he didn't try to come at me, you know. So don't try to come at them for the for the for the best I ever had record. I said no. How you? That's no no. First of all, Jay Z got the the phrase from me. That's why he didn't sue me or do nothing about that. I told them that Big John handles all Jay Z's publishing. I told him that directly. So he let me know Jay knew about the song, but I said no. Jay didn't come not give me. Didn't, didn't come sue me because of that. He knew I came up with that first. First of all, second of all, what you gonna sue me for? Well, I got an MTV Jam of the Week video. I'm an independent artist. What you gonna do? You know what I'm saying? Like what? You know what I mean? He ain't finna really get no bread off me. You know what I mean? Plus, I came up with it. So at the end of the day, nothing ever came out of that. You know what I mean? Nothing. But I sampled Jay Z and did not at all clear it at all because he sampled me was saying that particular line. Cause that was from me and everybody in Memphis know who came with that my fresh thing first. So yeah, just a quick story. <laughs> I even remember when I was younger, you would say to somebody, respect my fresh. Yeah. You're going to respect my fresh. Yeah. And like I said, man, it might not, the younger crowd might not. They might not know it. They might not know it. They might think it sounds a little corny today. But that was like a real thing, you know what I mean? It you was like a fresh ass jacket, and you'd be like, you do, you know? Yeah, what I mean? You're gonna yeah. You want to respect my fresh, like you know what I mean? It, that was from the swag era of music, swag, swag music. That I called my music swag music. I remember when Vibe magazine said, "What is he talking about swag music?" And what's trying to come out with his own lane of music? They dissed me in that it was joint early. It was it early. was early. It was early. After that, everybody's saying swag and making swag music. But it's like, but in drip, I'm mentioning drip back drip. then. You know what I'm saying? Drip Trap, rap. Like we were talking about earlier. Yeah. You know what I mean? yeah. But it, it was early. It just was early. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and sometimes you could be ahead of your time. And and sometimes it ain't a good thing sometimes to be like, man, you be ahead of your time. You really want to be right on time so that you can get all the benefits of the money from everything that when you're right on time. Sometimes being ahead of your time allows individuals to come after you and kind of take your sauce a little bit and then kind of make money off of it, but you be the one that did it. You know what I mean? So, and I've seen that too, but I don't be mad at it though. I'd be like, all right, what's whatever. You know what I'm saying? Also with the streaming, you know what I mean? Right on time. A lot of artists that dropped their albums in 2006, 2007, the streaming. 2008. Had, yep. The streaming had not caught up yet with the billboard chartings. Yep. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of artists like Lloyd Banks on his second album, Young Buck on his second album, yep. the album, you as well, my G. A yep. lot of people got screwed out on your record sales because yes, of how we did. it changed a few years later. 
Sure it did. It sure <laughs> did. It was the ending of an era and the beginning of another one. And it just, it was just, just wasn't the right time. It was like just ahead of our time. And that's just really what it was, bro. But I ain't never wanted to be able to just, I just be like, I, I just got to keep it moving. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, being able to produce, being able to write, being able to have other things I could do in music uh, and still being able to certify, serve my fan base through Empire and do that and just be able to just keep working. You know, that was a blessing to me, like not staying stuck. You know what I mean? Not being stuck. You, know, you can't, you can't. When you quit, that's when you dip. Like you just got to keep going. Like you know what I mean. Like you know that was a season, you know, and and then you know you have a season when you go bare. Like right now, we're in the winter time. If you have fruit on your trees in the summertime, no fruit gone right now. You know what I mean. It's, everything's going bare. You go through those seasons where you go bare. You go through that season, and then you can come back with your next season with new fruit. You got to realize you're a fruit tree. You got to realize that, and the fruit you have this season may not be the same fruit you had last season. You know what I'm saying? Like you may have an orchard. You may this tree may be popping off this season and they got these apples going, but you may have this orange tree over here popping or this peach tree over here going too. I got trees in my backyard, so all of them don't bloom the same, but they all go through the same process of having to go bare. So it's like that's just what it is. Certain seasons you go through those seasons, but you can't stop. We all in the season, the season will always keep going, so just keep going. You know what I mean? It's like I said in the intro, you know what I mean? You had your time where you were all over the screens, but then you mm -hmm. weren't afraid to take a step back and do some songwriting. Can you yeah. tell me how your bars end up on a little Wayne song? You know what I mean? Not a um, lot of people can say that. Um, Wayne, Wayne is a great wordsmith and lyric writer, but Wayne is not the best hook writer. You know what I mean? LeBron is a great player. LeBron doesn't have a lot of hair. You know what I'm saying? Like, Everybody can have everything is what I'm saying. So ultimately, like Wayne's ability to make to spit. When I bring beats to Wayne in his studio, because I already had the relationship with Wayne since 02. So now it's Wayne on fire, a Millie Wayne. And I go to Hot Beat Studio and I bring beats in there to be able to play Wayne. First of all, the fact that I got access to Wayne to be able to even do that in the time when he's selling a million units in a week, let you know the respect is already there. Number two, I go, I play the beat to Wayne, and I tell Wayne what the hook is. I always, when I bring beats to, to studio sessions, even, I was just working with Slim Jimmy from Ray Sherman two, two nights ago. When I bring beats, I have hooks with the songs so that artists can be able to just get in their bag real quick and we can get these songs done. So that's how I come. So when I came with the hook, we can do it real big, bigger than we ever done. I be up on everything. The other niggas never on it. So just do it for the boy. Bam. Wayne records that and lays the verse. Okay. Then Drake, as paying homage to the person that signs him, Lil Wayne, ends up using these verses, that verse and that hook, in his own song, thinking he's just paying homage to Wayne. But what you're not knowing is that on the publishing side of that, Kia Shine owns those lyrics. You see what I'm saying? And that beat. So when you sample from Wayne, you didn't just sample Wayne, you sample from me too. So I had to eat from that. And that's why you sample my music. But at the time, he's a young artist. He didn't know better. So when I'm telling him I co-wrote it, niggas is thinking I'm in the studio writing for him. No, I'm not writing for Drake. The song, the the beat and the hook that I did for Wayne is what ended up being on Drake's record. And I got a co-writer credit, which I got these BMI awards for right here. You know what I mean? And over here, you know what I'm saying? And a few more around here, around the room for the writer credit for that particular song. And that's really what it was. You know what I mean? So you had mentioned building uh, respect with Lil Wayne. How did you even get to that point where you and Wayne were on that level of respect? Well, I mentioned earlier in the interview that Dino Del Valle, who, so, who I sold my first beat to Universal, signed Cash Money. So when Cash Money was in Memphis for the big fight, Mike Tyson fight, they Dino introduced me to Wayne, to, to Baby Them and all that or whatever, because we were the hottest niggas in Memphis at the time. So that's why I was able to make that relationship from even back then in 02. You see what I'm saying? You, then you also said you had purchased some little Wayne. Uh, I bought a verse from Wayne. I bought a verse from Wayne in 02 to be on the Skinny Pimp project I put out. 
still pimping and hustling through TVT. So I bought a verse for 10 bands for Wayne back in 02. So we had the relationship since then. And I produced that song. The song was called Do What You Do. Featured Wayne, myself, and Skinny Pimp. So when you go and meet up with Lil Wayne for that feature, is it something that he records right then and there? Oh, uh, yeah. He came to the, we, we did it at House of Blues Studios in Memphis at the time. We did it in the studio. Yeah. It was that he did it. Every, like back then, it wasn't no sitting beast out. It was come to the studio. You in Memphis, let's get it done. So Little Wayne comes to the studio. How long does it take him to knock out the verse? What's the vibe? 20 minutes. I paid I pay the money to, to Manny Fresh because Baby wasn't there that day. I get a 10 bands to Manny Fresh. Wayne go in there, knock it out, 30 minutes. Done. So then your relationship changes with Wayne to the point where you can just bring him beats and hooks. Yeah. That's what relationship. That's why I tell artists one time when you sometimes when you're paying for, for production and you're paying for beats or you're paying for a verse, you really start to get that relationship with that artist, especially if they're doing it with you in the studio. You know, it becomes that open line of communication. And if you're real and that y'all connect on a good level, you know, you never can tell what a relationship will go from there. You know what I mean? So it's always important to, to you know, you got to spend money to be able to make money. But if you spend with the right people, you know, I spent 10 with him. But guess what? Well, I'd have made way more than 10 back with being relationship. You know what I'm saying? That 10 that came back way many times over. So, you know, it's very good sometimes to be able to just, you know, I ain't saying you got to buy your way in the game, but you do got to be able to pay respect and literally sometimes pay homage. You know what I'm saying? So Drake sampled Do It For The Boy on Best I Ever Had. When did you yeah. realize your lyrics were featured on Drake's record? Uh, a DJ from New York sent me the record because he thought I was – a DJ from New York sent me the record, and he was like, why did you sell the beat? He was trying to plug me the same, to sell the same beat to Jaheen. So the, 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 the DJ who was trying to connect the dot – it was like the beat that was on Wayne mixtape that I did. And the song it was called Sorry for the Wait. Do it for the boy was the name of the song. Jaheen wanted that beat. This particular DJ wanted to connect me with Jaheen to sell the beat to him because Wayne just did it on the mixtape. So I was like, cool. Then the DJ called me upset, thinking that I sold a beat to Drake and I was supposed to sell it to Jaheen. And he thought I cut him out of it. I said, send me the record. When he sent me the record, I was like, oh man, this do sound like my shit. But my nigga, I didn't sell this to them. You know what I mean? So if a DJ heard it and was like, yo, thought this shit was the same, I was like, I know my publisher will. Send it to my publisher. They say, yeah, this is definitely sample from your music. The musicologist says, yes, 25% of this song should be rewarded to you. And I was able to get all my credits and stuff from the song or whatever. Before it even got to payouts for the PROs, before it even came to having to sue, it was already switched over. So it was a... And then Wayne also bought the original track that I that he rapped on too from me as well for twenty thousand. So you know what I mean? It was all a blessing to me. All that happened before "So Far Gone" actually came out. Yep. So I ain't had to sue or nothing. I was already listed as Ian, you, Ian Coleman, which is my name, Nakia Coleman, was already listed as a writer. So when it came time to pay out or whatever, I ain't had to sue nobody. I was already in the system. So you know what I mean? It was all good. Drake made a statement where he said he borrowed one line from Lil Wayne. What were you thinking when that came out? I think that, uh, like I said to Angela Yee during that time, I said, you know, our people fell through lack of knowledge. And I think that um, you didn't borrow one line. We can do it real big, bigger than you ever done. I'll be up on everything. The other niggas never, you know what I'm saying? Like, you didn't just borrow the lines. You also borrowed the cadence. You also borrowed the flow. Your producer also sampled the same record that I sampled to make the remake the beat again, uh, which was from Playboy Records. Um, Hugh Hefner had a piece of that too. So you took a song and you just re you broke it down, and Boy Wonder pr pr reproduced my beat, and then you took some of the lyrics and y'all just remade that vibe. You cannot take lyrics, cadences vibes of mine and think i'm not finna come get it i'm coming to get it i'm like what well, denzel say i'm leaving here with something you know what I'm, I'm leaving here with something i'm from memphis man i'm leaving here with something i'm from around the way you can't do that you, you're taking from mine you know what i mean 
and I'm not influencing for no more. I've already did plenty of influencing. And you guys, damn, I didn't charge Wayne for that beat when he rapped on that song for his mixtape. I didn't charge Wayne nothing for that. But that song was just a mixtape song. Drake's song number one. I gotta eat. I gotta eat. Was Drake just simply misinformed? Like you borrowed a line from your man who borrowed a line from someone else. I mean, Drake just was misinformed at the time. He sampled plenty of Memphis artists after that. Now he understands exactly how it was, how it goes. Now he just was young at the time. You know what I mean? So when we had a conversation about it at a Grammy party back in 2010, you know, I accidentally walked into his Grammy party because we both were nominated for a Grammy, but I was just coming to a club that was popping on Sundays in, in LA. Happened to walk right into Wayne, happened to walk right into Drake. And we had a conversation about all of it. You know what I'm saying? So he just was misinformed. You know what I mean? You know, you don't have to sit there in the studio and be writing with, a, with an artist to be able to get the money off of artists. You know what I'm saying? You know, if you sample your work, you're going to be listed as a writer on that work. And that's just the business, you know? And he just wasn't misinformed about the business at all. And I don't char I don't, I don't hold that against him. You know what I mean? He just didn't understand. He was young. But he know how the business go now. And that's why I won. You know what I mean? Do you think this was an issue of Drake being exposed to having ghostwriters so early in his career, possibly being affected by that in the long term? Yep. Um, now I see why he was so upset about it. Now I see why he, he, he struck a nerve so much because he, he doesn't write all his music no way. You know what I'm saying? He doesn't. He doesn't. And it's okay for to get bars from this person or that person or whatever. Like, it, it, man, it's about the finished product. It, it's okay. You know what I mean? I don't think it doesn't make him less of a great artist. When you sign a contract, it's the recording artist, the art of recording. So he's a great recording artist. That's what he is. When you get a Grammy, it's for the recording art, the art of recording. So he is not about, it, it, that's what it's for. It's just the way you can record your voice, your music, how you record it, the art of how you do such. It ain't about you know who get the credit this that and the third it's just you know some artists know how to write all the way out to begin to end some need help it's okay it's okay if you need help but just don't pretend like you don't when you do that's all just be honest be transparent so i wanted to ask what are your thoughts on the kendrick lamar and drake battle i thought it was a great classic hip-hop battle i think it was due I think if Drake was due to catch an L, I think he just, you know, he was just due to catch an L. You know, uh, we all, nobody's perfect out here. You know, um, it was cool, cool battle. But at the end of the day, bro, Kendrick just is a, is a, is a, is a different animal when it comes to that. And, and Drake, the, the, Drake does not have his own sound. He does not have a city where he can be able to say, this is the sound of my city and I'm going to put my whole city on my back to go against you. Kendrick went to the West Coast sound and put the whole West Coast on his back and made them be like, we're going to support our own over someone that's an outsider. And ultimately, that's how he won the battle. Because Drake truthfully play me a play me a Drake. Drake has a sound when he sings his songs, yes. But give me a sound that's synonymous to his city. He's not really from Memphis, so don't say Memphis. He's but he does well with Tay Keith and Memphis producers. But he's an actor and he's able to, he's a recording artist, a great recording artist. So he's able to emulate whatever he's hearing. He's able to to do that well. But when Kendrick takes it to his core of where he's from, Compton, California, and produces that sound, you cannot fuck with him on that. You can't, there's nothing you can do about that. You know what I mean? And Drake, that's how Drake lost. Because you cannot do anything about that. There's nothing you can do about that. Nothing you can do about that. There's nothing, there's nothing you can do. That's why he won. He took it back to that. Not like us. West Coast over with. You know what I mean? It's just, it's not even fair anymore. You know what I mean? Drake don't have a, can, a Canuck sound, a Canada sound. What are you going to do? 
Like, you know, yeah, even if Canada riding with you, y'all in US, it was the perfect, it was a perfect shot. It was a it was a dead shot. You know what I mean? He just he just he used it was he just he, he killed him. He killed him. Nothing you can do about it. It was just, you know, it's just nothing you can do about it. Certain things you can't change. You can't change that you really from Canada. You can't change that you really ain't from here. And Wayne said it. Wayne said Drake would be cool as long as he keep rapping about the lover boy stuff, the heartbreak Drake stuff, the women. Don't get involved with this street shit. He'd be just fine. Wayne said that. There's a clip of Wayne saying this out there. If he would have did that, he would be just fine. When Drake tries to go hardcore, somebody going to pull your car, boy. You know what I'm saying? And that's what they did. You know what I mean? When you go hardcore, they're going to pull the boy car. That's what they're going to do. You know what I mean? And that's just what it is. A lot of times when you become great and you get a lot of power and a lot of money, a lot of success, great people do, they start the ego and their ego get full and they get full of themselves and stuff. And they start doing crazy stuff like throwing parties and doing they do powerful shit and start doing dumb shit with, you know, just doing things that are just pushing their power. You know, when Drake sometimes is doing things to show that he got the power, you know what I mean? But really, you're not really cut like like that. You 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 ain't cut like Kendrick from the cloth of Compton. You ain't really cut from that gang culture. You ain't really cut from that side. You know what I mean? So when someone really breaks you down, then it's like it just it becomes like it becomes an exposed. You're exposed. And 24 has been a year of exposure. A lot of people have been being exposed this year. Not just on music, just it's a lot of people, a year of being exposed. And Drake was exposed. That's all. He was exposed. What do you think of J. Cole backing out of the whole big three beef? I don't like it. I lost respect for J. Cole. And I know there are going to be some people that say, you're not. I'm, they, they, I have a flat. I had, I had an interview I did on, um, on the Memphis Grizzly podcast. And when it happened, I said, that's not hip hop, Drake. I mean, that's not hip hop, J. Cole. And I got some flat, some feedback. They were like, as a man, why do you want someone to be able to, 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 to lead to violence and all that? No, no, no. The Kendrick and Drake thing did not lead to violence. There was no violence. Okay. This is not Pac and Big. This was two lyrical individuals that had the opportunity to go head, head to head, pause with their skill set. And it was not going to do nothing but just go there. If you had something to need to, that you, 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 J. Cole bagged out because he may have was going to get exposed, you know, and that's what he bagged out. Cool. But don't be on them records like on that first person shooter record and, and, and all that or whatever, saying what you're saying about how you ready to come at you number one, you numero uno, you talking real reckless on these records. But when it came down to it, you really did not bag up what you were spitting. You didn't. And that's and, and I don't care how much you love J. Cole. And how much you, I love him. He makes great music. He makes great music. He's a humble guy. I love what he represents. He only all the fluff. He rides around his bike in New York. Dope. But don't, you have to live up what you said on those songs. You, you had the chance to go in. You did not go in. This is the truth. And people are like when they favorite artists do something that people can't accept it. I've been there before. People couldn't accept when Drake had a co-write from Kia Shine. They could not accept it. They could not fathom that their guy that they love so much he has this guy talking about he's so crispy and with all this drip has something to do with that. They could not take it. And that's the same way with J. Cole. They His fans can't take when somebody says, I love J. Cole, but J. J. Cole, that was real. A lot of excuses on that last album, the song you put out, all those excuses and all that or whatever, bro. Whatever, whatever, bro. You you were you weren't talking like that on those other records. And then when it came down to get to, to, to get tested, you 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 folded. Okay. And that's what really happened. And I don't care what you want to say, how you want to dress it up, that's really what took place. And it just is. 
It's just a fact. It it's a fact. That's what took place. Like that's what happened. That doesn't make him not a great rapper, a great artist. Not make him a no. It, but in that particular scenario, that's what happened. In the industry, people hate to just point things out. This is a truth. This is not a. This is not. A, it's an ugly truth. It's not a beautiful lie. It's an ugly truth. This is what happened. The ugly truth about Drake. He got exposed by Kendrick. It's the ugly truth. He's a great artist. He's gonna keep. But but in that instance, that was the truth. That's all. And I'm not scared to tell the truth about what it is. You know what I mean? Like P. Diddy. I'm not dragging him down by what he did. But the truth is, some of this shit you did. Some of it you were doing. Some of these situations, you cannot get framed if you're not in the picture. Okay? That's just the truth. J. Cole, you bagged out. That's what happened. You know what I mean? You call the truth because why? Because as as hard as Kendrick went on Drake, did Kendrick have some things on you? Did he have some things he could have some exposed on you? So you bagged out. That's what happened. And 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 I I will love his. I don't listen to his music the same. Make them cool songs about us something else, but don't him J Cole. Don't you get to no gang shit either. Stay out the gangsters way. Stay out there, stay out there, stay out that way. Do more of them spiritual songs, songs about women, do hip hop songs. Do some more of the sampling of Paula Abdul. Yeah, do more of that. You know what I'm saying? Like, but don't, 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 don't get involved with this, with the gangster stuff, the street stuff, because you clearly not cut for it. That's all I'm saying. Don't do it. Stay away from it. Is Kendrick Lamar getting the Super Bowl performance, the checkmate in the battle with Drake? Yes. Yes, he is. Big as the who? Big, big as the Super Bowl. Yeah, it's the, I mean, come on, man. You couldn't even script it out better. And because Jay Z don't really, it, it, there's some, there are some things between him and and and, and Drake in the in the that some rough some rufflings. It was a perfect opportunity to be able to uh to use that hand. You know what I mean? To go ahead and put the nail in the coffin. That's what he did. That's what he did, man. That's the it's the nail in the coffin. I'm not saying Drake won't have another hit record, but I'm saying that Super Bowl performance is that when you and J. Cole were saying big as the what? Big as the Super Bowl. And then this man gets the Super Bowl performance off of a record that's dissing you. Nah. You just, that's, that's the nail in the coffin. It's true. I'm only speaking facts. It is. It's facts. Where do you place Kendrick versus Drake in comparison to say Jay and Nas? I mean, we could bring up Biggie and Pac or 50 and Ja as notable beefs, but those beefs turned violent. And you clearly said we've seen this beef yeah. with Kendrick and Drake is not violent. But where do you put it in the comparison to a Jay and Nas? It's right there. It's tip for tap because that, that that did not go violent. It was just two juggernauts going at each other with the ether and and, and the joints with Jay. It was just two juggernauts. So I compare it. It's, it's, it's the A and B side. You know what I mean? They're both, they're, they're one and the same to me, you know, except for, you know, both at the time, it just, the, 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 at the time, the same effect Ether had is the same effect that they not like us had. You know what I'm saying? Like it to me, you know what I mean? As far as on against Jay, you know what I'm saying? Like nobody hadn't really hit Jay, or got a chink in his armor before. You know what I mean? He didn't, he didn't take one in the chin. Like, you know, it's like seeing Floyd Mayweather. We've never seen him get knocked out. You know what I'm saying? You know, but we've seen Floyd, you know, take a hit. Like, oh, oh, shit, Floyd got hit. You know what I mean? It was like, wait a minute, because Floyd could dance around that room and get, and get around everybody. He's he's not lost. Jay, I would not lose. And he, you know what I mean? And he was never getting hit. Always able to keep it on the head on the swivel. Nas called him. Bow. And... And Kendrick called Drake, bow, knockout, call. Him. So you know what I mean? Same, the same vibe, same vibe to me. Tell me if I'm bugging out here, Kia. But do you think there's a chance that Kendrick Lamar will bring Drake out at the Super Bowl? I, I would, I would think that would be. If that happened, man, listen, that would be beautiful if it happened, because it would also go to show that this was just two juggernauts 
going at each other on the lyrical side, a non-violent rap beef, which J. Cole should not have backed out of. You know what I'm saying? Like it would more prove the point. This is not non-violent. This is this is this is non-violent. It would prove the point that this is non-violent, and this was just two juggernauts going at each other. You know what I mean? It would be great. It'd be great for hip hop. You know what I mean? It would be great for hip hop. I, I, it'd be great for hip hop if you brought out Lil Wayne too. Be great for hip hop. You know what I mean? Be great for hip hop. I think he was gonna break Wayne out anyway. I think people should have just been quiet, and not said anything about it. Like let 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 it happen. You know what I mean? You know, and I, you know, but uh, but I think it'd be great for hip hop. You know what I mean? Because I don't hate Drake. I don't hate any of them people. I just be telling the truth about what be going on at the time. You know what I mean? You know, and sometimes if you have an opinion that's other than the popular opinion of the people, they try to put you in the box of hate. Not hate. It's just it's you want the beautiful lie, you want the ugly truth. The ugly truth is just the ugly truth. So it's the un, it's unpopular truth, but it's truth. Truth gonna be the same today, tomorrow, and yesterday. Young Dolph was self-made. He put himself on and he put PRE on from yeah. the streets of Memphis. You know what I mean? How was Young Dolph able to do that? Well, he had a backer by the name of Daddy O. Daddy O is very, very rich. Um Daddy O told me that he made more money than he made in the music industry at one point in time in 2020. He told me in 21, I think it was, he told me he made more money in 08 than he did all the music money he done put together. He came into the game with a bag and a real, a real guy who has the money to be able to put the muscle behind Dolph. In Memphis, if you come up, when you come up, you're going to need to be able to show the streets you got some money. And Memphis is a gangster city. For you to come up in Memphis, they need to see that you can compete financially with the ghost that came out before you. So with him not signing the Yogati and PRE being the exact um another juggernaut to go at CMG, they had to show the money. Dolph had the backing. He had the money to be able to go at the superpower. So instead of signing to to CMG, he became the competition, which ultimately became the reason why of his demise. Because these guys are trapper rappers that are rapping real things that are happening. And unfortunately, in that beef, bodies are now, you know, it's, it's people's lives are gone. Lives have been lost. Lives are in jail. Lives are just, you know, it's just all that because the egos are so big of individuals who have a lot of money. And it's hard to tell individuals things you know, when they get a certain amount of money, it's hard to talk to them. It's hard to explain to them that it's better to work together than apart. And even if you got your own company, your own thing, it's still better to not split the fan base, but to split or split the listeners, but to bring everybody together, put a tour on with CMG and PRE. That was the real, would have been the real business, but it's kind of hard when things happen in the street that go past a certain threshold, there's no coming back from it. Certain things happen, shots are fired, lives are being trying to take from being, and, and that are clearly have some connection to people that are on the other side. Things like that happen. It's like, yeah, it's going never gonna change. So, you know, that's how he was able to do it. And it just, you know, it's it's a small city, Memphis is, and um sometimes it's not big enough for for all of for all of that camaraderie to be going on and everything be 15 20 minutes away from each other like you know what i mean it's very unfortunate i heard to this day seeing how that played out i really wish it would have had a better ending you know Dolph, it's no reason why Dolph shouldn't still be here to this day you know also too you can't you just got to be careful with your power your tongue man when you blessed to be able to rap speak you got to be careful of what you speak which is you what you're saying you know, I always say that you speak what you seek until you see what you said. OK, so if you keep speaking certain things or antagonizing certain people or vice versa or keep certain people, man, take that stuff to heart and they're going to react, you know, and um, every action has a reaction. And I think both sides can see that. And I bet both sides in some kind of way would want it to change. You know what I mean? But, you know. 
it's just sad. It's very sad. I mean, me knowing Dolph, work with Dolph, got a song with him called You Could Tell that I did back in 2017 with him. Um, just a good dude, man. Father, leader. But, um, you know, just, you know, just got to, man, I hate those mistakes we made. You know, I was blessed with the opportunity to do interviews with both Yo Gotti and Young Dolph. Mm. What did you make of Young Dolph's decision not to sign with Yo Gotti and just do it on his own? I think it was a good decision. I mean, when you have the money like behind you, you don't have to sign to. If you can be a boss, be a boss. You don't have to sign anybody. Just keep do it all yourself. If you if you can finance your own thing and employ the right people, do that. Or do that. You know what I mean? Um, I just think, like, you could do that without downing the next man, though. Like, you know what I'm saying? You could do that without. I just, I don't believe. You know, I, I get it though. Sometimes, man, people do things and make it mad and make you you, you want to go off on them on record and stuff like that. I get it, man. But like, I just wish that you know that didn't happen. Though, I really wish that they they could have been able to like get their just been too juggernauts in the same city like atlanta got so many juggernauts in the same city you know what i mean just to be able to just do that in the same city man but I, that ultimately to get as far as you get out of memphis to let people from memphis bring you back down just this is just it just feeds the whole purpose how have the streets of memphis changed after young Dolph's death have you seen change i haven't seen change I think you have some people that recognize the vitality, the, the the recognize the what's the word? I think people recognize their mortality and that that this life is serious and that you know you need to take it real serious and like you know and, and move a certain way. Um, I think it helps those that are positive like myself and other individuals the city recognizes us more and they do things more for the heroes that are still here i think um the death still happened the the, the juke was just murdered this year you know so been a lot of bodies you know what i mean behind what's been going on unfortunately so fortunately it's been more murder this is always something I actually noticed, actually. When Moneybag Yo did a feature with Young Dolph, that's right around the time that Moneybag Yo was signed to CMG. You know, yeah. Yo Gotti was grabbing everybody up back then. Yeah, man. I mean, it's tough because I remember when Dolph died, how, like, you didn't see anybody from CMG say rest in peace to Young Dolph. Except for CEO, except for Big 30. You know, and I thought that was like kind of weird, like, damn, like, you know what I'm saying? I didn't see not one post saying that, you know what I mean? You know, so, you know, I just thought like, man, that was that was a kind of a telltale sign to me, like of what the climate or what the temperature is like, you know what I mean? You know. Crazy shit was going on between those two factions, you know? Yeah. CMG, PRE, and... Black yeah. youngsters, heavy camp. You know what I mean. Yeah, a lot of a lot of things, man. A lot of things, man. It, get, it gets deep. It gets very deep, you know. And and even with that trial that just happened, and things that came out in the trial and stuff like that. It's just, it's man. It's I don't know, bro. Like it just. I kind of try to stay out out of like you know what I mean. I'll be like you know because I'm like I still be around and move around. You know what I mean? So I don't want to like put myself in any, any harm's way. I just, uh, but I mean, everybody, we see what's going on though. Everybody sees it. You know what I mean? We, we see it, you know, so. You have had another connection to CMG through Glorilla though, you know, how do you yeah. feel about Glorilla? Um, how do you think she's putting on for Memphis right now, man? Man, I love it. I love Glow. Love, love Glow. Love what she's doing. Love what she represents. I love Glow, man. She's a great person. Just a breath of fresh air. You know, I was able to work with her on her first EP when she got signed to Gotti and she put that through Interscope. I produced a song on there called Get That Money. That was uh, 
That was a really dope record. She actually got on Breakfast Club on the first Breakfast Club interview and said to get that money was her favorite song on her EP. That made me feel really good. Um, but she's really a uh, really a talented artist that um uh, that is blessed. They got a, they got a whole a future so bright. You got to wear shades, man. You know what I mean? She's really got a lot a lot of a lot of a uh, lot, uh, lot of years ahead of her, man. So I'm 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 excited for what's happening for her, man. She deserves it. So how'd you link with Glorilla in the first place? Forgot I that. Marcus, I hit Marcus, her, her manager, and was like, yo, this girl, her voice, yeah, I need to get with her. He brought her to me in the studio with Tree Sound Studios in Atlanta. We went in there and we went right in. You know what I mean? And 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 put together some crazy records. And um, and we just went in, man. And we just had a great vibe. She's from Frazier. I'm from Frazier, which is a neighborhood in North Memphis. And um, just just we just our kin the kin she my kinfolk that's my that's my little homie right there man you know what I'm saying that's my kinfolk Frazier baby all the way and we just we hook, we hooked up and we ain't looked back since I got some more stuff coming though with her though you know what I'm saying I, I didn't catch this album I was kind of late on the one she just came out with but please believe 25 is gonna be live I got some I got some work to put in with it though you know what I mean for sure so right now you're still producing you've actually got a podcast. What else do you have going on right now? Uh, film and television has really been, um, has been, as of late, the thing I've been on. Um, basically, um, I um, have a movie coming out with the, with the Rock. It's called Red One. I have a part in that. Um, it's coming out November fifteenth in theaters. I am um, have a rec a video. You know, you know, have a movie coming out called Color Book which is just one um, at the uh, France Film Festival uh, Critics' Choice Award. We're going to be in LA this weekend at the American Festival, American Film Institute Festival in LA, Chinese Theater this weekend. Um, it's a, a Oscar qualifying film festival and this song, this, this movie is in it. It's a color book, uh, stars Will Catlett, um, uh, Brandy Evans, myself, uh, it's directed by David Fortune. It won the Trini the um, Tribeca Film Festival this year. Uh, AT and T's Untold Stories. AT and T sponsored the film, and it's a real, real story about a father with a child with special needs, who's played by Jai Daniels, and I play Rico, his best friend, in the movie. So it's doing the doing the festival runs right now. It'll be out next year. So that's I'm doing that. Um, of course, uh, this year I had Half Baked, Totally High, which was a remake of uh, Dave Chappelle's uh, classic that came out on Universal Film Studios. Um, it's out now. Um, of course, I've been doing like Superfly. I was in that. Um, they cloned Tyrone last summer, which was a big movie. I was the first thing you saw when that movie came on and the last thing you see when it went off. Um, so I've been definitely making the transition to film and television, um, which has been super cool for me. Um, got some really big things I'm working on for 25 um, that uh, you guys are going to see. Can't wait for y'all to see. But it's some two big, two big television shows that I'm in for 25. Um, so they got me on the the, the, the uh, non-disclosure thing, so I can't say what it is. But it's two major ones that are coming for 25 uh, on the Stars Network. I can tell you that. Um, but, um, so yeah, the film has been going on. We did the first, uh, season of immediately Kinfolk podcast working on a new, um, I did it through world star the first time, but now we're looking at possibly doing it through Tubi. um, we've got a few offers for it. We're kind of working out the scenario with that. Cause I got some interviews that I ain't released yet. Um, that's with some pretty big people. So, um, working on that still. So, uh, immediately Kinfolk podcast. Of course, I'm doing the um, my nonprofit with my wife, uh, autismadvocates.org. Um, it's a, our nonprofit for autism. We have a son, 13 year old Jameson, who has autism, non speaking autism. So, um, so we that's what we do. Um, we differ not less. We blessed by the best. He has a different ability. So, I definitely make sure that I am using my voice to bring awareness, inclusion, and acceptance to to that community so you know you want to tap in with that that's autismadvocates.org um as far as that's concerned but um it's a beautiful thing bro that you're doing man 
No, nah, thank you so much, bro. So we're we're definitely and it's just so blessed that this movie color book is about a special needs child. He has Down syndrome, but it's like to be able to give my experience as a special needs parent with to you know, because I'm doing a QA with this movie as well and being able to do that. It's just been it's been great. It's been really great. So I can't wait for y'all to see the color book when it comes out on the platforms or what have you, man. But it's a great, great movie. Um, and I'm ready to see how this rock movie comes out because I got prosthetics on my face and we we it's Amazon Studio movie. It was a huge budget, and I got some cool parts in it. And I can't wait to see how it comes out as well. And, uh, did you get a chance to act Me with the, the Rock? Yeah, I, I did a fighting scene with the Rock. Oh, that's crazy! Yeah. Man. I did, a, but and that's why I just can't wait to see how it all comes came out, bro. Because I did a fighting scene with dude, bro. How many days were you on the set for this? We did it. We filmed it from November of twenty. What about, it was 20, uh, 22, November of 22 till March of 23 is when I was that, that yeah, November 22 to March 23. How, how many days were you on set? Like we was, I like four or five days a week. You know what I'm saying? That's and cool. it's because my character is like a is like a it's a tech merc right so we're like this group of guys that work under this lady who's like a a, a, a mean snow white you know what i'm saying or whatever right and so it's like even if i d didn't have lines that day i may have something i'm doing um on this on in the in the set you know what i mean like whether i'm moving something or whether i'm whether i'm just you know just moving to whatever she her commands are then i had some days where i did have lines you know what i'm saying so it's like, but it's like the, to keep the continuity of our crew, these tech mercs, we always had to be there. You know what I mean? So it was a good payday. And it was also a lot of great experience, too, to be able to just see some of these greats work. You know what I mean? And then the fight scenes and stuff like that. It was a lot of, a whole lot of things going on, bro. You know what I mean? A lot. So when you're doing a fight scene with The Rock, is he using a stunt double at all? Or he used stunt doubles until it's time to do the real scene. Then he does. Then he comes in and he does it. You know what I'm saying? So did he give you any advice about acting? I mean, he just, I mean, he just, he just like, it wasn't really about giving advice. I think when I first met him, it was like, I told him how when I played on Atlanta, season two of Atlanta, my first role when I was opposite of Donald Glover. And his lady said, you ain't gonna work that much because you tall. And I was like, damn, why would she tell me that? I was going to say something smart back to her, but I was like, yeah, just like, all right, whatever. But I told, but I thought in my head, I said, damn, the rock is tall. You know what I mean? I'm thinking about other people that's tall. I'm like, so when I met him, I said, bro, I'm going to tell you, I told him the story about what happened on Atlanta. And I was like, you know, uh, but now I'm sitting here on a movie with you. And he was like, yeah, bro, anything can take place, bro. Anything. You just keep working. You know what I mean? And just, we just had a good vibe, bro. Just a good energy. You know what I mean? I, I I try not to like bother dude too much. I just like actually just did a lot of watching, you know what I mean? And just observing his skill set and how he worked and what he did, how he did what he did. You know what I mean? And, and that's what I did. Just watched a lot and got a chance to be a fly on the wall right there watching him work. You know what I mean? And being able to pick up a lot of things by seeing what he was doing and how he did what he did. So I got that game right there from him. You know what I mean? Because I was able to, his actions, I was able to learn from his actions. Did you have any scenes with Chris Evans, Captain America? I, I, didn't, I didn't. I didn't see Chris Evans one time, not one time when I was shooting. I didn't see. I, I um the other cat um uh, J.K. Simmons. I got a chance to work with him. He was there. Uh, Lucy Liu got a chance to uh, work. J.K. Simmons, yeah, that guy's awesome. Yeah, both, both, yeah, both J.K. Simmons, Dwayne Johnson, and Jake and uh, and Lucy Liu. I was all able to be there with. You know what I'm saying? But uh, I didn't. I didn't see Chris Evans not one time. That's crazy, man. You got an opportunity right here. This movie will probably make a quarter billion dollars. I mean, yeah, you go to theaters. Yeah, it's going to theaters November fifteenth. Oh yeah, that's right. Because sometimes yep. Amazon will produce a movie. Like I don't know if you saw that movie with Chris Pratt where he was fighting those white aliens and they yeah, and he went right to Amazon. Them. Yeah, yeah, went right went, to Amazon. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? That movie with uh fucking uh Michael B. Jordan, I think it was called No Mercy or something, where his yep, family right to, came yep, up right yep. to Amazon because they're trying to build their company, sort of like yeah, uh yep. uh 
Apple films, how they did yeah. Kill of the Flower Moon and how they did um the Napoleon movie, those biographies. You know, it, it, so, right to, it goes right to the uh to the joints, which is either way, that check they're gonna be the same, you know what I'm saying? It'd be it like cause when they go to, to the networks or whatever, and it's number one on you know what I mean, whatever streaming service or whatever and stuff, bro. Like, you know, you get a residual from that. So that's gonna be cool. And then when they go in the movie theaters, you get a residual from that too. So it's gonna be cool. The residual from that junk should be nice. You know what I'm saying? It should be a nice residual. Seriously. What up? This your Kenfo Kia Sean. What up? What up? What up? What up? I right, I right. Kenfo. This is Uncle Kenfo Kia Sean right now. I'm chilling with Mikey T, the movie star. And we got a great interview lined up for y'all. It's immediately repeatedly, yes. Immediately. <laughs> 